take them to Bath. At that moment, shouting loudly, a man arrived on horseback with several companions. It was Sophia's father. Mr. Weston was asking loud questions about his daughter when Tom came downstairs with Sophia's ring in his hand. My daughter's ring, shouted Weston. Where is she? It is her ring, said Tom, but I have not seen her. He is a liar, cried Mr. Fitzpatrick, for I caught him in bed with her, and, sir, I'll take you to her room. Mr. Weston and Mr. Fitzpatrick rushed up the stairs together, and once again Mrs. Waters was disturbed by men bursting into her room. Mr. Weston was shocked, apologized, and rushed off to look for Sophia in the other rooms. Mrs. Waters now got dressed and prepared to leave. When it was clear that there were no young ladies in the inn, Mr. Weston cursed everybody, ordered his horses, and rode off with his companions. Mr. Fitzpatrick invited Mrs. Waters to travel to Bath in his carriage. Tom paid his bill and set off on foot with Mr. Partridge. And that was the end of Tom's adventures at Upton. Chapter 15 Sophia Finds a Place to Stay When Sophia and Honour left Upton, they asked their guide to travel towards London. They had just crossed a river when they heard the sound of horses behind them. Sophia ordered the guide to travel faster. Faster still came the horses behind them, and soon they were overtaken. The travellers who joined Sophia were also a lady, her maid, and a guide. Very politely, the two parties agreed to travel together. They rode steadily, without speaking, until daylight came. Then the two ladies, who were riding side by side, looked at each other and said with one breath, Sophia, Harriet! The wise reader will not be surprised to learn that the lady whom Sophia recognized was Mrs. Fitzpatrick, for she had indeed been staying in the inn they had just left. What will surprise you is that Harriet Fitzpatrick was Sophia's cousin. They had once lived together with their aunt, Mrs. Weston, and were dear friends until Harriet had run away to marry Mr. Fitzpatrick at the age of eighteen. In the afternoon they stopped at an inn to eat and rest. Sophia, who had not been to bed for two nights, slept until after the sun went down. When she woke, she ordered tea and told Harriet that she was travelling to London. Her cousin agreed to accompany her. She had planned to go to Bath, or to stay with her aunt Weston, but her husband's sudden arrival at the inn in Upton had changed her mind. Sophia now felt so fresh that she suggested leaving immediately. It was a clear night, and not too cold. Harriet begged her to wait until morning, so the two cousins stayed the night in the inn and exchanged stories. Harriet's story was so tragic that when dinner came, Sophia could hardly eat. Harriet had suffered from cruelty, jealousy, and terrible unhappiness, but her appetite seemed excellent, and she stopped for a while to enjoy her meal. Then she finished her story. Mr. Fitzpatrick wanted the last of my money. He never beat me, but he did lock me in my room. I had no pen, no paper, no books, just a servant to make my bed every day and bring me food. I was desperate. But by very good fortune, well, I will not tire you with the details, I managed to escape. I made my way to Dublin took a boat to England, and was travelling to Bath when I stopped at Upton. My husband overtook me there last night, but though I heard him, he did not find me. Sophia gave a sigh. It was now time to tell her story, which she did, and I hope the reader will excuse me, Peter. will say one thing. She never mentioned, say one, she never... To end, she never mentioned, take, take, take... Very late that evening, an Irish lord arrived at the inn. Learning that Mrs. Fitzpatrick was upstairs, he sent the landlord up with a message. Harriet seemed very pleased to receive the message, and invited the lord to visit them immediately. 
He seemed to be a very special friend. He was a neighbour of Harriet's in Ireland, and in fact it was with his help that she had managed to escape from her husband. But for some reason she had not given this information to Sophia. The Lord seemed surprised that Harriet was not in Bath. He very politely offered to take the two ladies to London in his carriage. Harriet accepted instantly. When the Lord left, Harriet spoke warmly about him and his love for his wife, saying she believed he was the most faithful husband she knew. Then it was time for sleep. Next morning, the ladies paid their guides, and it was then that Sophia discovered she had lost something. It was a banknote which her father had given her to buy her wedding clothes. She searched everywhere, but the note was not to be found, and she realized she must have dropped it on the road when she pulled a handkerchief from her pocket. The ladies and their maids now got into the Lord's carriage and set off, accompanied by many servants. They travelled ninety miles in two days, and on the second evening arrived in London. They were taken to the Lord's house. As his wife was not in town, Harriet absolutely refused his invitation to stay in the house, and lodgings were found for her. Sophia spent one night with her cousin, but next day sent a note to Lady Belliston, the relative she had met at her aunt's house. She was immediately invited to stay with her. Harriet seemed happy for Sophia to leave her alone, and Sophia began to suspect the reason. She tried to give her cousin some wise advice. "'Consider what a dangerous situation you are in, my dear. You are a married woman, and your friend's wife is not here. People will gossip.' Harriet was amused, and said, "'I will visit you soon, dear Sophie. Now, please try to forget your country ideas.' So Sophia went to Lady Belliston's house, where she found a warm welcome. Lady Belliston promised to give her all the protection which it was in her power to give. And as we have now brought our heroine into safe hands, we can leave her there for a while and return to poor Tom. Chapter 16 Rich Food When Tom and his companion Partridge left Upton, they marched with heavy hearts, though for different reasons. They came to a crossroads, and Tom asked Partridge which road they should take. "'If you take my advice,' said Partridge, "'you will turn around and return home.' "'I have no home to return to,' cried Tom. "'Even if my godfather would take me back, "'I could not bear to live there without Sophia. "'Now since I cannot follow her, let us follow the army. I believe they went this way. And by chance, Tom chose the road which Sophia had taken. They marched on for several miles and arrived at another crossroads. Here, a poor man in rags asked them for money. Partridge was very rude to him, but Tom gave him a coin. Master, cried the man after thanking him, I have something interesting here which I found about two miles away. As you are kind, I know you will not think I am a thief. Would you like to buy it? He then passed a little gold notebook to Tom. He opened it, and, guess reader what he felt, saw on the first page the words, Sophia Weston, written in her own fair hand. He kissed and kissed the page. While he was kissing the book, as if he had a delicious little cake in his mouth, a piece of paper fell from its pages to the ground. Partridge picked it up and gave it to Tom, who shouted that it was a banknote for a hundred pounds. Partridge was delighted at this news, and so was the honest man, though it is fair to say that perhaps he was honest because he could not read. Tom immediately told him that he knew the owner of the notebook and would follow her and return it. He paid him a pound for the notebook and asked him to lead them to the place where he found it. They then walked together to the place where Sophia had unhappily dropped the notebook and where the man had happily found it. 
Tom opened the notebook a hundred times, kissed it as often, and talked to himself as he walked. When they arrived at the place, the poor man, who had been thinking about the banknote, now said to Tom, Please give me half the money I found. Tom refused. I will give it to the right owner, he said. But let me write your name in the notebook, and one day you may have a reward. Our travellers then left the man and moved on so fast that they had no breath for conversation. Tom thought about Sophia. Partridge thought about the banknote. And as they came into the next town, they met three horses, led by a boy whom Partridge recognised as the guide who came to Upton with Sophia. The boy told Tom that Sophia did not need the horses any more, as she had continued her journey in a carriage. Tom quickly offered to pay him to take them to London instead. The boy agreed, and now Tom and Partridge continued their journey on horseback. Reader, my pen will not describe the roads, the rivers, and the other beauties which passed by as our travellers rode towards London, but one cold, wet night there was a conversation which I will repeat. Sir, said Partridge, we have had no dinner today, yet you look fresh and strong. Do you live on love? This dear notebook is my food, said Tom, and very rich it is too. Rich, yes, cried Partridge, for it has enough in it to buy us a hundred dinners. Partridge, said Tom, what are you suggesting? Oh, nothing dishonest, answered Partridge. Where is the dishonesty in spending a little now, if you repay it later? As your own money is nearly finished, where can be the harm, if you need it? A great lady does not need it, especially if she is now with a lord. Partridge, said Tom firmly. Finding and spending is the same as stealing, and stealing is a hanging matter. This note is the property of my own dear angel, and I will put it in no other hands but hers, even if I am starving. Chapter 17 Tom Receives an Invitation When they arrived in London, Tom sent Partridge to find lodgings while he began his search for Sophia. He started looking for the house where the Irish lord lived. He walked through the streets until eleven that night, and began again early next morning. At last he found himself in the right street, and someone directed him to the lord's house. Tom was dressed in country clothes, and these showed signs of many days on the road, so when he knocked on the door... The servant who opened it was not very polite. He said there were no ladies in the house, and that the lord was busy. Fortunately, another servant was listening. He followed Tom into the street, and offered, for a sum of money, to show him where the two ladies were staying. It was very bad luck that Tom arrived at Harriet's door about ten minutes after Sophia had left. The maid took a message upstairs— but Harriet sent back a message to say she was too busy to see Tom. He was sure that Sophia was in the house with her cousin, and probably angry about what had happened at Upton. He told the servant that he would call again in the evening, and spent all day in the street, watching the door. But nobody came out. In the evening he returned to Mrs. Fitzpatrick's house. This time she agreed to see him. Tom asked about Sophia but Harriet told him nothing. She said that he could call again the following evening, then sent him away, as she was expecting another visitor. As nothing unusual happened during the next visit, which was from her friend, the Irish lord, we will pass quickly to the next morning. Harriet worried about her cousin's unexpected visitor, and decided to ask the advice of Sophia's relative, Lady Belliston. She got up before the sun, and at this unfashionable hour she went to Lady Belliston's house, hoping to see her while Sophia was still in bed. Lady Belliston was very interested in Harriet's story. She especially liked her description of the young man, a very handsome fellow, and so charming. 
Lady Bellaston thought she should see the fellow before deciding what to do. She promised to visit Harriet that evening, and told her to make sure Mr. Jones was there. That winter's day was one of the shortest in the year, but to Tom it seemed one of the longest. Though six o'clock was the polite time to visit, it was soon after five when he knocked again on Harriet's door. She received him kindly, but still said she knew nothing about Sophia. After some time, Tom decided to explain that he had a large sum of money that he wanted to deliver to Sophia. He showed Harriet the notebook and told her what it contained and how it was found. They were now interrupted by the arrival of an elegant lady, who was followed a little later by the Irish lord. Everyone bowed low to each other. Then a brilliant conversation began, which, though it was very fine, I shall not repeat. Tom watched this fashionable scene in polite silence, as nobody took any notice of him. At last, Harriet asked Tom to tell her where she might find him the next day, and he soon left the company. Now the elegant visitors took a great deal of notice of him, but nothing they said was very kind, so I shall not repeat that either. Lady Bellaston then left. The Lord, for some reason or other, now made Harriet promise she would not see Mr. Jones again, and as nothing else passed between them of importance to us, we will return to our hero's affairs. The place where Tom had sent Partridge to find lodgings was a house in Bond Street, where Mr. Allworthy always stayed when he was in London. It was owned by Mrs. Miller, a good woman whose husband had died, leaving her with two young daughters and not very much else. Though Tom did not know this, Mr. Allworthy had given Mrs. Miller the house and a sum of money for furniture, so that she could earn money by renting rooms. Tom had a room on the second floor, and Partridge one on the fourth. On the first floor was a pleasant young gentleman called Mr. Nightingale. When Tom arrived back that evening, Nightingale invited him to share a bottle of wine. Their friendly conversation was suddenly interrupted by a maid who brought in a packet which had been delivered by a stranger for Mr. Jones. Inside was a mask, a ticket for a party the next evening, and a message that said, The Queen of Fairies sends you this. Be kind to her. You are a lucky man, said Nightingale. I am sure these were sent by a lady who wants to meet you at the party. Tom did feel lucky. If Mrs. Fitzpatrick had sent the packet, he might possibly see his Sophia at the party. He decided to go, and invited his new friend to go with him. The next evening, Nightingale invited Tom to eat with him in town before the party, but Tom excused himself. To tell the truth, he had not a penny in his pocket, and had to borrow some coins from Partridge. Partridge took the opportunity to advise Tom, once again, to go home. "'How often must I tell you that I have no home to go to?' answered Tom. "'When Mr. Allworthy gave me the envelope of money, I don't know how much it was, but I'm sure he was very generous. He said he never wanted to see me again. Partridge had never heard of this money before. He asked what had happened to it. Tom told him how he had left the envelope beside a stream in Somerset, and how he and Black George had gone back to look for it, but without success. Then a message came saying that Mr. Nightingale was back from dinner and was ready to leave for the party. Chapter 18. Sophia has a rival. When the two men arrived at the party, they walked about together for a while, and then Mr. Nightingale left Tom alone. As everyone was wearing masks, he looked for ladies with Sophia's shape and spoke to them, hoping they would answer with Sophia's voice, but none of them did. Suddenly, a masked woman tapped him on the shoulder and said, Follow me. He followed her to the end of the room, where she sat down and said, in a soft voice, Miss Weston is not here. My good fairy queen, said Tom, you have cleverly changed your voice. But I know you are Mrs. Fitzpatrick. 
Please tell me where I might find Sophia.